Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends to this lecture on uh, B. R. Ambedkar and from B. R. Ambedkar we will be focusing basically his thought on caste and also his views on liberal democracy and constitutional moralities. So, we will have three lecture on B. R. Ambedkar. Today we will discuss his views on um, um, his uh, personal political life, his engagement with uh, untouchable questions and his difference with Gandhi and Congress and also uh, his views on partition very briefly and then we will conclude today's lecture. In the next two lecture, uh, in the uh, second lecture we are going to discuss his views on caste uh, through his text Annihilation of Caste and um, um, also his debate with uh, Mahatma Gandhi on the question of um, eradicating or using his word annihilation of caste and in final concluding lecture we will discuss his views on liberal democracy and constitutional morality. So, uh, if we uh, look at Ambedkar and uh, uh, his appropriation and misappropriation, his symbolic use uh, by many political parties uh, not necessarily sharing the substantial argument that he is making about restructuring Indian society or the hierarchical uh, relationship embedded in Hinduism and how to eradicate. See, they may or may not necessarily share with uh, the substantial arguments Ambedkar is making about that, but in contemporary times you will find all parties universally almost um, try to uh, use uh, Ambedkar and his works at least symbolically to mobilize the public support or especially the vote from the depressed classes. And therefore, there is a kind of uh, uh, absence of serious engagement which he, with, uh, with his thought and philosophy. So, you may also find uh, uh, the uh, uh, almost commonsensical understanding of Ambedkar uh, merely as a uh, leader of um, Dalits or at best uh, the constitution maker, but Ambedkar also dwell upon a lot of issues social and political issues and develop his own thought um, uh, uh, thought about that and uh, his uh, visionary thinking or prophetic pre uh, predictions has uh, uh, resonated in many of the post colonial politics that is unfolding certainly from 1980s and 90s. So, there is a kind of uh, revisiting or re-engagement with Ambedkar in our contemporary times and uh, there are many political parties uh, um, uh, explicitly uh, appropriating Ambedkar's uh, and many groups um, using Ambedkar as a icon of empowerment as a liberation and the crit, uh, uh, and many parties trying to appropriate um, uh, Ambedkar symbolically and use Ambedkar's um, uh, icon to uh, to kind of uh, start alternative politics. But there are also serious uh, um, um, limitation in such appropriation and misappropriation with the critically thinking or analyzing Ambedkar's uh, Ambedkar's which we will discuss during the course of our uh, three lectures. If we look at uh, B. R. Ambedkar, who is widely regarded as the architect of Indian constitution or the maker of Indian constitution. So, the famous icon or statue of Ambedkar carrying Indian constitution in one hand and showing the way with the other hand have become a kind of symbolic image to those who cannot read or write constitution and yet they can affiliate 
or they can associate themselves with the constitution and the rights enshrined therein. So, the statue of Ambedkar in different parts of the country have used in a way by the Indian state to at least symbolically send across or put across the message about the role of constitution as the basis of uh, governance or the uh, uh, institutional structure uh, in India. So, uh, B. R. Ambedkar who is uh, um, uh, who was the chairman of the drafting commission is rightly regarded or widely regarded as the architect of Indian constitution. Besides that he was also a devoted champion of socio-economic and the political rights of the Dalits. Now, this word Dalits is used by Ambedkar and in Marathi this word is mean broken and for Dalits the word untouchables was also very much used in the um, political discourse of uh, colonial India and all his life he strived for forging India's moral and social foundation anew and strove for a political order of constitutional democracy that is sensitive to disadvantage inherited from the past or engendered by the prevailing social relation. So, Ambedkar despite of uh, his devotion to the interest or to the causes of uh, socially, economically and historically depressed classes of Dalits, he was equally involved in forging a kind of moral and political uh, bond or foundation of a new India, which would be a kind of political order of constitutional democracy that is sensitive to the disadvantage inherited from the past or because of the prevailing social hierarchy. So, Indian society was or is divided on the caste line, religious line, linguistic lines and the caste uh, discrimination which is there for thousands of years and there have been different movement resistance to such caste hierarchy start from Buddhism, Jainism to the Bhakti uh, movement of uh, medieval India and also in modern times when Jyotiba Phule and many others were arguing or Nanak and many others were arguing about um, uh, equality, social equality. Uh, Ambedkar developed it further to make untouchability as the central question of political discourse. So, uh, he differed with uh, many uh, uh, contemporary leaders and parties including Congress, Gandhi and Nehru on the question of untouchability. So, how one can form a political unit or an Indian nation as a political community based on certain principles when the society is deeply divided on the basis of caste. So, without eradicating or annihilating the caste and this discrimination and humiliation on the basis of caste he has experienced throughout, uh, throughout his life. So, he was arguing that without the uh, eradication or annihilation of caste, one cannot really forge a nation or a political community based on the principle of equality, fraternity and liberty. So, he was also trying to envision or forge a kind of political and moral foundation based on uh, constitutional democracy and not uh, on the basis of uh, the whims and fancies or the uh, particular culture or uh, uh, religious world view, but the constitutional uh, democracy he was arguing and we will discuss more on uh, this when we will discuss his views on liberal democracy and constitutional morality. But he was trying to envision a political and moral foundation of new India which would be based on a constitutional democracy that will be sensitive to the disadvantage which uh, they have inherited from the past or they are engendered by the prevailing social relations. He did see India as possessing a cultural unity, especially when he was studying in Columbia University or uh, had uh, uh, engaged or was trying to make sense of India from a distance, then he saw it as a cultural unity. But his sense of seeing India as a cultural unit was very different from many of uh, his contemporaries, especially uh, those who came from the upper caste intellectuals. So, uh, many upper caste intellectuals talks about uh, diversity or heterogeneity in India and also the unity that encompasses those uh, diversity and heterogeneity and that unity for them, the upper caste intellectual was the tolerance and accommodation of the difference. 
So that is what gives unity to India, the tolerance or accommodation of difference according to the upper caste intellectual. Contrary to their understanding of this unity, Ambedkar thoughts and there he shares with uh, many uh, scholars who were skeptical of the feasibility of Indian nationhood or India as a nation or as a uh, single political unit. For Ambedkar saw this unity built on a foundation of oppression rooted far deeper than the political rule of the Raj. So, here it is also uh, perhaps um, necessary or uh, important to understand the question of uh, political freedom or the social reforms movement. And in many of my lectures, previous lectures, I have discussed this question that how uh, modern quote unquote Indian renaissance that we call it started with social and religious reforms movement and how over a period of time the political freedom or the struggle against the British to attain independence was uh, uh, considered prior to the say social reforms and other. So, within the Congress, within the political public discourse uh, during the colonial uh, times, this question of social reforms on the one hand and, uh, um, and attaining political freedom from the British rule, which was the root cause of India's uh, degrading status. Uh, so, there many leaders were arguing that one can attain the independence and then after attainment of independence, one can reform the social uh, issue and social challenge. But of course, there are um, uh, exception to that uh, uh, rule. Certainly, Gandhi in mid uh, 1930s beginning to um, um, uh, take or engage with this question of untouchability very seriously. And especially after 1911 uh, census uh, about caste and community, which uh, provided the basis of such kind of political discourse and uh, seriousness to, um, uh, uh, to engage with the question of untouchability and eradicate the social uh, 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 hierarchy that exists within the Hindu society was something many leaders uh, began to take seriously. And from 1920s, the question of untouchability becomes the uh, major question during the anti-colonial uh, uh, movement and Ambedkar provided this solid leadership. There were different organizations and they differed from each other about how to reform society, how to bring equality and remove a hierarchical relationship, but Ambedkar provided the intellectual as well as the political leadership to the question of untouchability and represented himself and there was a kind of consensus, uh, there was a kind of um, acceptance of him as the representative of the excluded community or the Bahiskrit uh, Bharat as one of his uh, uh, magazines uh, uh, call. So, for uh, Ambedkar, the uh, uh, oppression or the exploitations that a majority of Indian population has to undergo is not just because of the political rule or the exploitation of the British, but it has deeper root in the Hindu uh, caste society, which uh, excluded a vast number of um, uh, number of um, uh, uh, their own uh, uh, followers or their own uh, fellow member from uh, uh, accessing the public uh, tanks uh, or wells or uh, temples and he began to uh, conceptualize and articulate the root cause of such, um, uh, such oppression or such discrimination against the uh, untouchables or the um, uh, Dalits as uh, he, he called them. So, for them the um, unity of this India is based on the foundation of oppression which is rooted much deeper than the political rule of the Raj and therefore, for him the question of social and economic equality of depressed classes or the untouchables become the central question of political uh, movement and activities. And uh, therefore, he saw caste and caste based discrimination as the single most challenge in the evolution of India as a united political community based on the principle of liberty, equality and fraternity. And in this for him the fraternity treating the other with dignity or with respect or the mutual love and respect for the fellow feelings which is the basis of all political community as a single unit is lacking in India because there is the 
prevalence of uh, caste or caste based discrimination and before eradicating this uh, impediments it is difficult or it is impossible for india to evolve as a political community where there is a respect for the principle of fraternity equality and uh, liberty so his philosophy or thought was a profound critique of caste which maintain hierarchy with minimal use of physical force it operates largely by voluntary submission characterized by an ascending scale of reverence and a descending scale of contempt so ambedkar perhaps understood the uh, basis or the uh, uh, foundation of this caste uh, based discrimination which is so prevalent so uh, widely internalized by different sections of indian society that it uh, it uh, does not require the use of uh, physical force to reproduce itself so it reproduce itself by voluntary submission and that voluntary submission is there is so much of socio economic and political privilege attached to a particular caste that different layers of caste because of their different level of uh, uh, privilege that uh, uh, that is given they do not come together to uh, to eradicate the whole system uh, as such so uh, they face discrimination they face different uh, level of privilege or deprivation but they do not come together to uh, eradicate it or see it as a common uh, common problem so uh, he beautifully uh, narrated is the caste um, this voluntary submission characterized by an ascending skill of reverence so the lower caste uh, having reverence for the upper immediate upper caste that uh, mid, in, intermediary caste having reverence to the uh, upper caste and so on and so forth and in reverse order also the contempt for the lower and lower immediate and this is the way in which caste continuously reproduce itself without the use uh, use of uh, sheer violence or uh, physical force so um, caste in india is something which is rooted much beyond the mere uh, mere social or um, uh, political uh, discrimination but it has uh, rooted in the psychology or in the uh, uh, sense of uh, selfhood or subjecthood uh, among different sections of uh, indian society and there the discrimination is layered not uh, one against the other because so many uh, uh, heterogeneities within the uh, depressed classes or depressed castes uh, that exist uh, that it becomes difficult for them to come together and fight this common um, uh, common um, problem or common um, uh, impediments for this and this uh, this perpetuates uh, uh, not just discrimination but also the humiliation and that becomes uh, uh, the um, basis of many uh, uh, new kind of theorization about understanding in society through this concept of humiliation in the contemporary world but uh, for um, ambedkar he first uh, understood um, uh, what sustains uh, the caste even when there is the minimal use of physical force and wh- why people continuously justify the uh, caste uh, system or sustain it even when they are trying to forge a nation which will be based on the question of equality liberty and fraternity so th- some of these questions remain very uh, profound in his thought and thinking now to uh, look at the personal and political life of uh, bhimrao ji ambedkar some of the basic facts about uh, his life is that he was born on 14th april 1891 into an untouchable caste mahar and this caste in western india were recruited by the britishers in the military for their loyalty or for their commitment to the work and diligence so his father ramji sekpal was the instructor in the local military school and he was influenced by jyoti rao phule and many progressive groups or social reforms movement that was emerging in western india so ambedkar was influenced by his father in a sense to understand in the very childhood the question of untouchability and how to fight untouchability or attain the respect or dignity 
in the eyes of others. So, Ambedkar studied in a school in Satara, where influenced by his intellectual abilities, a Brahmin teacher changed his surname from Ambavadekar to Ambedkar. And Ambedkar completed his high school in 1907 and graduated from prestigious Elphinstone College in 1912 where he studied English and Persian. So, after graduating, he received one of the two scholarships, which Maharaja of uh, Baroda Shivaji Rao III, who himself was an active supporter of social reforms, instituted for the backward caste students to study abroad. And uh, after receiving one of that scholarship, Ambedkar joined Columbia University in US and he went there in 1913. Here, Ambedkar completed his master's and earned a PhD on national dividend, a historical and analytical study. And he also wrote a major text uh, which formed his thought or his engagement with the caste question, which is entitled Caste in India, Their Mechanism, Genesis and Development. So, despite of his interest in economics, laws or the monetary policies or the welfare issues, Ambedkar also remained deeply involved with this question of caste and uh, the uh, uh, justification, the basis of uh, this caste system and how it can be uh, eradicated and how it has uh, also uh, uh, continuously uh, um, practiced uh, in contemporary India as well. So, uh, um, this question of uh, caste remains very uh, uh, central to his uh, political life. So, uh, after uh, completing his uh, MA and PhD from Columbia University, Ambedkar moved to London and joined London School of Economics in 1916 for another doctorate. And there was also a time that uh, UK and uh, education or higher education that one attains in UK was considered uh, as if with more respect then uh, a degree that one earns from say US or some other uh, foreign university. So, he also went to uh, London for another degree, but he had to interrupt his studies and co uh, come back to India in 1917 to serve in the administration of Baroda state. However, the caste discrimination and the humiliation he faced there because no landlord was willing to rent their home to him because he comes from an excluded community or the untouchable community. So, this humiliation and uh, discrimination that he faced there forced him to quit that job and move to Bombay, which is now Mumbai. And he was appointed as a professor at Sandham College of Commerce and Economics, which was established on line with London School of Economics at Bombay. But however, he also suffered or faced the caste based discrimination there from the other faculties of the college. So, it was at this time that he seriously began to uh, campaign for Dalit's socio-economic and political rights. And in 1919, he gave evidence to the British in favor of separate electorates. So, then he gradually developed a uh, sense that uh, untouchables have to fight their own struggle. So, the Congress or the British cannot uh, fight on their behalf. So, they began to seriously articulate this question of caste and also uh, began to involve in the um, practical politics or the uh, electoral politics to uh, secure the rights uh, of Dalits and de or depressed classes. So, in 1919 when remember there was this um, almost every 10 year new uh, reforms act or constitutional development to Indianize Indian administration or Indian bureaucracy. So, to say in 1919 th uh, there was such attempt and he gave the evidence to the British administration for the separate electorates of the untouchables and reserve seats for them and religious minorities much before government of India act 1990 which led the foundation of self-government or local self-government in India. In 1920s, he started a weekly Marathi paper called Mook Nayak, 
विच स्ट्रॉन्गली क्रिटिसाइज द कास्ट हेरारकी एंड कॉल फॉर ए दलित अवेकनिंग एंड मोबिलाइजेशन अगेंस्ट द इन इक्वलिटी और द डिस्क्रिमिनेशन डेट दे फेस इन देयर एवरी डे लाइफ इन एक्सेसिंग द पब्लिक स्पेस और पब्लिक प्लेसेस और वाटर रिसोर्सेज और टेम्पल्स एंड सच डे टू डे डिस्क्रिमिनेशन एंड हायरारकी डेट दे हैड uh they had to face so uh, the mook nayak was one of the first journal he started in 1920s to uh, express the anguish uh, the um, demands or to mobilize the public opinion especially among the depressed class to make them aware or politically aware about their uh, rights uh, uh, in um, Uh, rights on public uh, resources like tanks wells and uh, 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 temples etc so he also along with sahu maharaj of kolhapur organized first all india conference of the depressed classes in nagpur where he stressed upon the fact that the depressed classes in india had to fight their own struggle so for ambedkar his life long politics was to enable or to empower uh, the depressed classes or the untouchables through education through awareness through public activities through uh, satyagraha of uh, different kind to fight for their self respect to fight for their dignity and to fight uh, injustice or the uh, discrimination that they are subjected to in their daily life so um, uh, they uh, uh, he was uh, uh, articulating a struggle for uh, untouchables which would be uh, which would be independent from say uh, the uh, politics or the movement uh, done by done by congress and its leadership and also the left parties and others so he realized that the depressed classes has to fight their own struggle in india and he was very concerned about the status or the rights of untouchables or depressed classes in free uh, free india and from 1920s till 1940s almost for 2 3 decades he constantly or continuously uh, through different uh, mechanisms through his writings through his public activities Uh, by organizing different groups uh, by launching some uh, protest movements or satyagraha he was trying to actually mobilize uh, the um, uh, excluded community or to give them a sense of empowerment to fight injustice and uh, discrimination and also um, uh, invite them or to uh, convince them that they had to fight their own struggle and it is not or it cannot be done by the congress and gandhi or any other uh, party however in 1920s ambedkar went back to london to resume his studies and his dsc thesis was the problem of the rupee and he spent few months in germany and went back to england to qualify as a barrister um, uh, as a barrister from gray inn in london and he returned to india and began his legal practice at bombay high court he also taught mercantile law at batley boys accountancy training institute bombay from june 1925 to march 1928 and he also taught law at government law college bombay about a years in 1928 29 so in 1924 he started a society to spread education among the depressed classes so ambedkar besides his public activities or the political movement or negotiation with the british to uh, safeguard the uh, interest of uh, the dalits he was equally focusing on the education as the mechanism to fight injustices or fight discrimination and ambedkar himself was uh, conscious of the role of education in terms of developing the sensibilities against any form of uh, injustices or discrimination and also to fight such discrimination and injustices so education for uh, ambedkar is central in the emancipation of the depressed classes or untouchables and he emphasized uh, on the role and spread of education especially among the depressed classes 
same year he intensified his campaign for social reform by establishing Bahiskrit Hitkarni Sabha or group for the well being of the excluded. So, for him in India there is a uh, two, uh, two category, two, two India in a sense uh, of one upper caste India uh, or privileged India and the other is the excluded India or uh, the uh, silence or uh, uh, a majority of population who is subjected to a kind of psychological condition where they submit to the caste uh, discrimination and caste hierarchy even without realizing it forget about resisting or fighting such uh, discrimination and uh, uh, injustices. So, Ambedkar was uh, fighting uh, for such uh, empowerment uh, for the depressed classes not just to fight them that will come after the education after the awareness, but to realize that there are discrimination and there are, dis, uh, there are differences. So, in a sense Ambedkar was most radical and revolutionary in his approach to politics about social reforms and also about the formation of uh, uh, political communities. So, he uh, intensified his campaign for social reforms by establishing Bahiskrit Hetkarni Sabha to promote socio-political awareness among the Dalits and raise public awareness about their grievances. So, he constantly through his writings, through his petitions, through his engagements with the British and officials and also through press like Mook Nayak and later on many uh, journals he started, he developed uh, or made in a sense the question of untouchability as the central question in Indian uh, political movement and uh, certainly Gandhi began to take this question of untouchability very seriously after uh, such uh, mobilization or articulation of uh, uh, their grievances and their status by Ambedkar. Uh, in 1927, he led this famous Mahar Satyagraha to assert the rights of untouchable to access public tanks and wells. So, as the public property or public resources were inaccessible to certain communities such as temples, tanks or wells against uh, such um, uh, restrictions um, in 1927 um, Ambedkar famously um, um, led this Mahar Satyagraha to, to assert their, uh, their access or their right to access public tanks and will. However, this uh, Satyagraha was confronted by the caste Hindus and Ambedkar and his followers publicly burned Manusmriti to defy religious and ritual confinements upheld by the caste Hindus. So, Manusmriti is a text or a code of law which sanctions this kind of discrimination or this kind of uh, 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 injustices. So, um, uh, Ambedkar was um, uh, aware or the um, uh, un uh, understood the root cause of the caste discrimination is based in the Hindu rituals or Hindu uh, religious text and he uh, publicly uh, along with uh, many of his followers burned this, uh, uh, this text and which becomes a kind of symbolic assertion of their defiance of uh, 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 rituals and religious practices or texts which, uh, which is uh, discriminatory, which uh, sanction such practices of discrimination uh, discrimination and it is also an act of uh, political assertion and empowerment that they are no longer submitting to uh, those uh, text those rituals or practices which justify such discrimination or injustices so uh, this was a public act of defiance against such religious and ritual confinements which was upheld by the caste hindus and in this understanding he was very radical from a kind of um, um, relaxed approach in gandhi towards the hindu orthodoxy which justify which uh, uh, reproduce such discrimination and injustices and therefore that uh, uh, discrimination so both of them wanted to reform society to build a stronger India, uh, to strengthen the unity of India, but the approach uh, to eradicate such social uh, social problems or uh, caste hierarchy was very different and uh, so objective 
may be similar as uh, uh, now there is a uh, um, kind of um, re-engagement with the thought of Ambedkar and Gandhi, which we will discuss certainly in the next class. But the approach differ very much from each other, where Gandhi seems to be more accommodative of um, uh, Hindu orthodoxy, where as uh, uh, Ambedkar was very critical of such uh, orthodoxy uh, among them, Hindu uh, or caste Hindu. So, in 1927, he also started a fortnightly, which becomes the vehicle of oppressed class or depressed classes and their issue, which is called Bahiskrit Bharat. He was appointed as a member of Legislative Assembly of Bombay in 1927 for five years. And since then, he took legal and administrative routes to promote and protect the interest of depressed classes or untouchables. And over the next 20 years, he played a key role in the organizing of untouchables. So, also because of the po popular movement or popular mass movement led by Congress and Gandhi was for the freedom struggle. And Ambedkar realized that the protection of um, um, untouchable interest and their rights uh, may not be necessarily done through uh, political or public uh, mobilization alone. He was uh, 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 organizing many satyagraha, many uh, protests, but he also uh, took uh, the legal or administrative route as a viable means to protect and promote the interest of untouchables. And uh, this he continued to do uh, uh, for the next two, uh, three decades at least. So, um, he took the opportunity presented by the British government to petition for the political rights of Dalits and excluded, even when the Indian National Congress chose to boycott constitutional reforms discussion, such as Simon Commission visit to India. And he gradually developed a difference with Congress and its leadership on this question of untouchability and how to remove caste or eradicate caste and remove the practices of untouchability in India. So, he found three political parties to fight for the rights of Dalit. In 1936, he found independent Labour Party to fight the elections, they fought the elections and won 15 seats also. He formed the Scheduled Caste Federation in 1942 that was intended to unite all untouchables in India and also the Republican Party of India was conceived in 1956 to unite all the dispossessed untouchables. See, he also when fighting against the caste Hindus, he was also simultaneously trying to mobilize or unite the depressed classes, which was not an easy task which, which he himself expressed when he said the caste privilege that is associated to different layers of the um, uh, different um, uh, layers of Indian caste uh, society it is very difficult to unite them or uh, uh, to create a united front to fight the common practices of caste because of the uh, relative privilege that is associated and different caste groups are entitled to. So, he constantly tried to mobilize or unite them by forming different political parties and also collaborating with other parties and groups as well. In June 1942, he was nominated to the Viceroy's Executive Council and when India became independent in 1947, Ambedkar was made Minister of Law and Justice and he introduced several progressive legislation to create an egalitarian society or to remove caste and gender based hierarchical structure of Hindu society such as Hindu Code Bill and which becomes a very contested bill and uh, faced enormous opposition from the Hindu orthodoxy on which he resigned. So, he was fighting for a egalitarian society or a society based on the principle of fraternity and equality, not just political and legal, but also social and economic. And he was fighting it outside the Congress uh, for uh, from 1920s uh, till uh, his uh, appointment as a first law, uh, first minister of law and justice. But once he uh, compromised with the Congress and uh, helped in shaping the constitution, protecting certain rights or safeguards uh, for minorities or also the depressed classes or uh, uh, articulating some of the concept, uh, concepts and convincing the uh, members of constituent assembly about many of the contested issues in the constitution. Um, Ambedkar was also um, uh, trying to uh, 
create a society, a egalitarian society from within. But when even that uh, fails, he resigned from the ministerships in 19, September 1951. And by then, he also developed a deep uh, uh, attra uh, attraction or attachment with Buddhism and he regarded Bu Hinduism as the root cause of the social uh, hierarchy or the uh, caste based discrimination that exists. And this he began to develop. Uh, from 1930s onwards, but he also had a kind of comparative study of different religions and finally, uh, converted to Buddhism in 1956 with his millions of uh, followers and six weeks later he died in New Delhi. Now, to look at his differences with Congress and Gandhi, we find that Ambedkar was of the opinion that the reform could come only through the purposive action of a state. So, the role of a state along with Nehru in Ambedkar is very much central. So, they advocated for the state, he should be strong enough that no community from the, uh, no community should dominate the functioning of a state. So, in a sense, state should have an interventionist role, autonomous role in society to create uh, a more egalitarian society according to the uh, laws and constitution. So, uh, uh, he uh, was of the opinion that reform is possible only through the purposive action of the state. So, in his testimony to the Simon Commission, Ambedkar argued that depressed classes should be treated as a distinct independent minority as separate from the Hindus. And he also advocated direct action for the fulfillment of their rights and launched Satyagraha to allow untouchables to drink water from tanks and enter temples from which they were excluded. And he asked for greater representation of the depressed classes at all levels of public services. So, he continuously tried to protect the interest of uh, depressed classes, not just against the upper caste or caste Hindus, but also by negotiating with the British administration or the British rule and wanted depressed classes to be treated as a separate identity along with say uh, Hindu and Muslims. And he was also trying to create the political space uh, 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 for depressed classes along with Muslims and Hindus in India in their negotiation with the British. And in 1930s and 40s, Ambedkar wrote a series of tracts criticizing Gandhi and the politics of Congress. So, in 1930s, the relationship between the two became increasingly fractious. Ambedkar saw Gandhi's attempt to persuade Hindus to reform rather than reject the caste system as ineffectual and a barrier in Dalit's emancipation in the protection of their socio-economic and political rights. And therefore, uh, his uh, understanding of the causes of the caste system and how to eradicate uh, it was very radical, very different from the Gandhian uh, approach by merely appealing to the caste Hindus to, re to reform uh, and all. So, as a representative of different classes, Ambedkar attended all the three round table conferences in London and it is here at the, especially at the second round table conference that he began to seriously differ with Gandhi and his views on caste in India and uh, he continued to uh, uh, argue or respond to Gandhian position till Gandhi's death in 1948 and we will discuss it in the next uh, lecture as well. So, Ambedkar here with this uh, uh, representation and his oratory skill and use of argument um, um, uh, had a successful negotiation with the British, which resulted in 1932 Ramsey Macdonald Award, which is also known as Communal Award, which uh, uh, provided separate electorates for minorities including the untouchables. And this become like a bomb for the Congress or many Indians and in protest Gandhi started a fast unto death. Later a compromise was reached with Ambedkar known as the Pune Pact, whereby it was decided that a joint electorate would remain for Hindus, but with greater seats for the depressed classes. However, with this arrangement nobody was happy. So, many of the Gandhi and Gandhiji and his followers uh, thought that Gandhiji considered too much to Ambedkar to give more seats to the uh, depressed classes. On the other hand, um, Ambedkar and his followers thought that they lost a great opportunity to emancipate themselves, to fight uh, for their uh, their rights 
and they were subjected to the domination or the um, unjust um, uh, practices of the caste Hindus. So, Ambedkar writes it like that the communal award was intended to free the untouchables from the thraldom of the Hindus. However, the Pune Pact is designed to place them under the domination of Hindus. So, the Pune Pact of course, was a kind of compromise and uh, maintain the uh, unity within the Hindu community, yet we have uh, we continue to see in our post independent India or even in contemporary times, where the whole logic of Ambedkar is in a way inverse. So, now the question is no longer about uh, annihilation of caste, but uh, state and its policy itself treat caste and the provision associated with caste as something which, uh, which is going to stay and it includes newer and newer community within different uh, uh, different uh, categories uh, uh, for affirmative actions and the welfare po uh, policies of the state. However, uh, uh, Ambedkar was envisioning a society which will uh, be free from any caste discrimination. So, annihilation he was talking about not the uh, uh, sustenance or continuity of uh, the caste uh, discrimination. Although he was critical of British colonial government, Ambedkar was often at odds with Congress and the nationalist movement predominantly because they clashed over how to address the issue of untouchability. So, we have seen Ambedkar's approach more radical and revolutionary than the nationalist or the Congress position on the question of caste. So, uh, despite Ambedkar's differences with the Congress, when India became independent in August 1947, Nehru invited him to be the first Minister of Law and Justice and shortly after the Constituent Assembly appointed him as the Chairman of the Drafting Commission and that was his major role in shaping the constitution or drafting the constitution of free India. Ambedkar's influence can be seen in many aspects of Indian constitution such as the strong emphasis on liberal democracy which we will discuss in one of our lecture the federal structure of uh, governance and the provisions and safeguards for minorities alongside the empathic abolition of untouchability. So, it is perhaps because of his influence that constitutionally untouchability is banned or prohibited or is subjected to punishment if it occurs in any part of the country against anyone. So, constitutionally untouchability is abolished and protection of their social, economic and political rights in the form of affirmative actions or what we call reservation is also protected through constitution. However, uh, uh, Ambedkar thought of it uh, for few uh, uh, years as a temporary mechanism and he was thinking about a society which will be free from any kind of um, um, discriminations or any kind of um, preferential treatment or a kind of patronizing. Uh, uh, approach to uh, solve some problem, but uh, it has taken a new turn which we will discuss in the final lecture uh, why it is so. Ambedkar uh, realized and he argued that the political democracy is meaningless without social and economic democracy. However, he remained confident that the new constitution provided a solid foundation for such transformation of political democracy into a social and economic democracy, which he thought post independent India will achieve. Now, if you look at very briefly his views on partition, Ambedkar was convinced that the demand of partition was not just a result of political distemper or differences between the two communities, when identity become the basis of their political demands or the political unity, then one has to concede on many pragmatic or political grounds. And he also considered it was not a passing phase. He was convinced that the very characteristic of Hindu and Muslims was culturally different and their coexistence will depend on their struggle to survive the existing forces in Indian society. So, the demand for a separate nationhood for Muslim was put forward by many leaders, especially Muslim leagues, Jinnah, Iqbal and many other prominent leaders. And therefore, Ambedkar made an attempt to understand its implication sensibly and intelligibly. He argued for the partition of India even before the independence and he wrote a book titled Pakistan or Partition of India in 1945, where he argued in favor of 
partition. Ambedkar elaborately presented here the question of self-determination and in what political, socio-economic circumstances such a right to self-determination should be sanctioned. And he also elaborately presented facts in favor of his arguments on partition and he took into account perspective of defense, Muslim sentiments, financial resources, communal peace and exchange of population for his defense of two nation argument. So, in a sense he has a very pragmatic political approach to this question of partition supported by the question of self-determination. So, uh, Ambedkar also um, uh, articulating about uh, the political space for the depressed classes alongside Hindu and Muslims in their negotiation with the British or when there was a um, uh, moment of uh, transfer of power or inevitable transfer of power from the, uh, from the British to the, to the Indians. And uh, Ambedkar was worried about the future of depressed classes uh, in India and therefore, he was trying to uh, protect the interest um, and constantly compromises on many of his um, um, beliefs or many of uh, um, uh, the principles he stood for uh, when uh, he uh, joined the um, Congress, uh, he joined the Congress led government uh, and became the law minister, um, took the responsibility of drafting the constitution, became the chairman and also uh, expressed his thought and uh, faith in the constitution or uh, in the liberal uh, democracy that he envisioned for free India and through that the social and economic, um, economic um, uh, uh, transformation or uh, democracy that he wanted India to achieve. Uh, his views on caste and partition we have touched briefly. Tomorrow in the next lecture we will discuss his views on caste especially through his text on annihilation of caste. And also we engage with his views on religion or how Hinduism or Hindu text justify or sustain this discriminatory practices when we will discuss his engagement with Gandhi. Now to conclude this lecture, we find Ambedkar as one of the most educated men and thinker of his generation. It is inappropriate to engage with him and his thought merely as a leader of Dalits or untouchables or as a maker of Indian constitution. He closely studied and critically analyzed Indian society and politics and was prophetic in his predictions about the structure and functioning of Indian democracy and constitution. So, it is now a kind of cliche to use or appropriate Ambedkar symbolically or um, present him as a leader of untouchables or the messiah or liberator of the depressed classes and also as a maker of Indian constitution. In the process, we, uh, we tend to uh, uh, restrain from seriously engaging or critically engaging with his uh, thoughts and its various aspects, which was very uh, uh, remarkable or prophetic in so many ways. And um, his observation of Indian society and functioning of Indian society and the role of constitution and possibility of its misuse by the uh, caste society was also something which we need to seriously in, uh, ser seriously engage with when we discuss uh, Ambedkar and not merely use him uh, symbolically uh, for alternative politics or for uh, the constructive politics or whatever. So, this uh, symbolic use or appropriation of Ambedkar is perhaps the reason his stature as the hero of modern India, there is a kind of limitation in engagement with uh, his thoughts and ideas because of um, uh, this uh, reduction or uh, symbolic use of Ambedkar either as a uh, leader of depressed classes or as a maker of Indian constitution. We need to think uh, more critically or engage more critically about uh, various sides of his writings or activities. That is also perhaps the reason why in contemporary times, there is a kind of universal acceptance of Ambedkar and his thought across the party from left to the right to the center to the parties which subscribe to Ambedkar and uh, his views like Bohujan Samaj party and many others or even the radical Dalit politics that is emerging in contemporary uh, India. So, this is perhaps the reason his stature as the hero of modern India has undoubtedly grown over the years, especially in the last two decades 
uh, after uh, 1990s certainly. So, Ambedkar has become a kind of hero or a kind of uh, thinker which uh, provide a kind of universal uh, uh, reference point to different parties di across the uh, political or ideological spectrum and there is now resurgence of works on or around the ideas of Ambedkar which we need to seriously engage with. Now, uh, on this lecture we have had today, you can look at some of this text. This text, the essential writings of B. R. Ambedkar by Valerian Rodriguez is one of the crucial texts which compile the essential writings of Ambedkar. This book you can refer to and also the Ambedkar Building Palaces on the Dung Heaps from Sunil Khinnani, Incarnations India in 50 Lives you can refer to courses you can refer to understand. Thanks for listening, thanks for your patience. Thank you.